Due to the graphic nature of this program, viewer discretion is advised. I mean, the poor thing deserves a better faith than that. I mean, the, I mean, the poor thing deserves a better faith than that. 10,000 pieces of human remains have been unearthed on the former property of one of Indiana's most notorious serial killers. Herbert Baumeister is believed to have killed at least 25 victims during the late 1980s into the early 90s. Welcome to the haunting story of Fox Hollow Farm. Fox Hollow Farm, located in Westfield, Indiana, was a serene estate until it became notorious in the 1990s. This property is now etched in the annals of true crime history due to the atrocities committed there by former owner Herb Baumeister. The chilling discoveries at Fox Hollow Farm and the aftermath form a macabre tale that continues to fascinate and horrify. Herbert Richard Baumeister was born on April 7, 1947, in Indianapolis, Indiana. He showed signs of psychological disturbances early in life. Baumeister exhibited problematic behavior from a young age, which included playing with dead animals and urinating on a teacher's desk. The continued behavioral issues led to a diagnosis of schizophrenia in his teens, though he did not receive treatment for his condition. The problems he experienced in childhood seemed to fade as he reached adulthood. He married his wife, whom we'll call Jay, in 1971. They had three children. Baumeister founded the successful Save-A-Lot thrift stores in Indianapolis. Just a few years later, the flourishing chain allowed him to purchase Fox Hollow Farm. The family moved into the sprawling estate in 1991. It was a dream home, with an indoor swimming pool and 18 acres of forest to enjoy. Sadly, the family would only enjoy it a few years. In the early 1990s, gay men began disappearing from the Indianapolis area. They would be seen by loved ones and then, suddenly, disappear with no trace as to where they went. Despite the attention that Jeffrey Dahmer's 1991 apprehension received, the situation in Indianapolis received little attention. Any connection between these disappearances and Baumeister remained unnoticed for years. Researchers believe a variety of issues was responsible for this lack of investigative attention. Primarily, the victims were individuals that did not have an extended social network or family. They were often seen as transient people who wouldn't be missed, so there was no need to devote resources to them. Plus, there were typical stigmas associated with the victim's sexual orientation. Miraculously, a lone survivor came forward in 1994. Tony Harris is the only known survivor of an encounter with Baumeister, and his determination to come forward saved an unknown number of lives. Harris could only offer the name Brian Smart. This was an alias Baumeister used. They went to a large house with an indoor swimming pool. Smart said he was just the hired help of the owner. Harris described a terrifying evening with a man whose mood erratically shifted from high to low. Harris thought Smart was going to kill him for much of the evening. He only survived it by using his wits and awareness. Even with an eyewitness, the investigation stagnated two more years. Baumeister's private life began to spiral long before, behind closed doors. He worked at the DMV for years before he became a thrift store magnate. His employment was not without issue. He urinated on a letter to his boss at one point, and somehow didn't lose his job. The final blow came when he urinated on a letter that was going to the governor's office. Later, Jay admitted they didn't have a conventional marriage. She said despite being married over 20 years, the couple had only been intimate five or six times. His behavior grew more erratic in the 1990s. His stores began to decline. They were reported as being dirty and poorly managed. Employees began to report Baumeister disappeared for hours at a time and often returned smelling of alcohol. Tony Harris's initial information on Brian Smart didn't provide them with much. Luck was again on his side, however, in 1996. He noticed Smart at one of the gay establishments in Indianapolis. He was able to get his license plate number. Finally, the police had a concrete connection. The plate was registered to one of Baumeister's cars. 
However, it wasn't until 1996, during a divorce from Jay, that the police obtained permission to search the property, revealing the full extent of his crime. The Indiana Department of Transportation maintains over 11,000 miles of roadway, and we paint those miles of roadway each year, and this is just an isolated incident that happened. The drive-by striping, <laughs> you know, whatever. Herb Baumeister of Carmel saw it all. I said to my son, they're going to hit that raccoon with a spray gun, and sure enough, they just striped right over its face and neck. You know, didn't even move it, you know, no effort to, you know, get it out of the way. So I happened to have a Polaroid with me, so I took a shot at the thing. A raccoon, which met its demise on the yellow line, became one with the paint. The raccoon has since been removed. This is all that's left. This was just, you know, uh, the painter should have had a chalk line drawn around his career by state officials. There was no excuse for that. I mean, the poor thing deserved a better fate than that. So just what is the explanation for this? For that, we went to the state highway department itself. Well, the Indiana Department of Transportation feels like this is a regular... Detectives began talking with Jay in 1995. She asked her husband about their attentions, and he said the police were just harassing him. When his son found a human skull in the woods behind their house, that went to a full skeleton. He told his family it was a fake skeleton used by his father, who'd been a doctor. Baumeister emphatically forbade the police from searching his property. They didn't have enough evidence for a warrant, so their only hope was to continue talking with Jay. By 1996, Jay grew more suspicious of her husband's manic behavior. She first assumed it was due to their marital strain and lack of communication. She forbade the authorities from searching the first few times they asked. Detectives continued to talk with her when they saw her shopping or away from the home. They eventually revealed their suspicions, but even then, she didn't know what a homosexual murder was. Baumeister, however, was growing increasingly involved in dubious late-night activities and adamantly refused to allow anyone near certain parts of the property. She permitted the police to search the estate while Herb was away. What they found was devastating. Countless human remains scattered the woods behind the house. The remains of at least 11 men were uncovered, though the actual number today is believed to be over 25. Fox Hollow Farm became the central point for this investigation. The bone pile is in this area here. All of the intact bones, the stuff that we would easily recognize as human, were found in this mulch pile on the other side of the fence and in the creek. This is the area where the burn pile was, right in this area here, and this is where the anthropology team had found most of the small bone fragments, uh, over 5,000 bones and bone fragments in this area here. So the killer would, after his son found uh, a skeleton which was just to the left of this tree, that's where his son found a complete skeleton, the killer decided to start picking up the bones off the ground and he started burning them in this area right here. Uh, over time, uh, the drains from the house all drained down this way and, and bones were found all scattered throughout this area here. Joe, my renter, was walking his dog about two years ago this month and found uh, a bone in this area right here. And of course we turned it over to the anthropologist and it was determined to be a, a left and it was a very uh, bright ivory color. It wasn't like a regular dead stick on the ground. I picked it up. I thought, well, what animal chewed that up? And, and I felt very, very heavy. It was much heavier than a stick. At that point, I knew it was a bone. This one. I felt good that we found it because it could potentially help identify one of the victims here. The Baumeister's idyllic life was now annihilated. It was clear that his family were just as much his victims as those he killed. Everything they knew was destroyed. Baumeister's method of luring his victims followed a chilling pattern. He would frequent gay bars in Indianapolis targeting young men. He invited them to his home with promises of a private setting away from prying eyes. Once at Fox Hollow Farm, Baumeister would engage in sexual activity with his victims before strangling them to death. The remote and secluded nature of the property allowed him to commit these murders without drawing attention. He burned most of his victims in a trash pit in the woods behind his house. Uh, we're in the pool room, which is in the basement of the house. 
Uh, this is an area where the police believe that most of the killings took place. Uh, Herb would lure the guys here uh, with a promise of the indoor pool, and then they would participate in what's known as this erotic asphyxia, where they would take turns choking each other during some kind of sexual activity, and at some point, Herb was choking them to death. And when the police uh, initially got here, uh, after this all kind of broke loose, this room was uh, had mannequins in it, uh, in various poses. Area that's been uh, sort of a, a hot spot for paranormal activity in the house is the pump room, which is down here on the left. It seems to be an area that's very active paranormally. Uh, one of the psychics said that she felt that her had kept maybe a body in here until it was maybe more convenient to take it. Baumeister fled to Ontario, Canada after he discovered the authorities had searched the estate. He committed suicide at Pinery Provincial Park on July 3, 1996. He left a note that blamed his failing marriage and business troubles for his decision to kill himself. He didn't mention the murders. The authorities eventually discovered hidden cameras installed in the pool room where he was believed to have taken his victims. The recorded VCR tapes were gone. A Royal Canadian Mounted Police officer noticed Baumeister's car under a bridge the day before his death. Baumeister said he'd just grown tired and pulled over to sleep. He had a back seat filled with VCR tapes. When he killed himself, he no longer had those tapes. Researchers suspected he threw them into a body of water before he died. The true extent of his carnage remains unknown. Modern estimates point to a victim count of over 25, and recent numbers state that over 10,000 pieces of human remains have been found on the estate thus far. Did he have an accomplice? Was he an accomplice to someone else? Baumeister left a countless number of unanswered questions that will likely never have an answer. As if Baumeister's extensive record of slaughter at Fox Hollow Farm wasn't extensive enough, Another killer terrorized the area in the 1980s. Like Baumeister, he primarily targeted gay men and boys and left his victims in rural areas, often near streams or creeks. His known reign of terror ranged from the 1980s through 1991. The I-70 Strangler strangled his victims, just as Baumeister did. The I-70 Strangler was believed to have stopped in 1991, but did he? Or did he just acquire a vast acreage that allowed him to dispose of his victims at Fox Hollow Farm? Was Baumeister also the I-70 Strangler? The debate continues today. The spirits at Fox Hollow Farm are believed to be those of Baumeister's victims. There are frequent reports of ghostly figures around the property, disembodied voices and strange sensations. One chilling account involves a visitor seeing a man in old-fashioned clothing who vanished before their eyes. Fox Hollow Farm has garnered a reputation for paranormal activity since the gruesome discoveries. Visitors and subsequent owners have reported eerie occurrences, such as unexplained noises, apparitions, and the feeling of being watched. The paranormal activity has attracted the attention of numerous ghost hunters and paranormal investigators. Television shows like Paranormal Witness and Ghost Adventures have featured the farm, documented eerie occurrences, and tried to communicate with the spirits there. Investigators often capture audio and visual evidence of paranormal phenomena, adding credibility to the claims of those who have experienced the hauntings firsthand. One of the most common paranormal phenomena reported at Fox Hollow Farm is the appearance of ghostly figures. Witnesses have described seeing apparitions of men walking through the woods and along the property's driveways. Shadowy figures have been spotted inside the house, often disappearing as quickly as they appear. Many who visit the farm report hearing unexplained noises, such as footsteps, whispers, and even screams. These sounds often occur when no one else is present, leaving witnesses unnerved. Some claim to hear voices calling out their names or engaging in hushed conversations. Poltergeist activity has also been reported at Fox Hollow Farm. Objects are said to move on their own, 
doors open and close without explanation, and electronic devices malfunction unexpectedly, these occurrences add to the unsettling atmosphere of the property. Visitors frequently experience sudden drops in temperature and the feeling of being watched. These cold spots are often attributed to the presence of spirits. Some individuals report feeling an overwhelming sense of dread or sadness in certain areas of the farm, particularly near the locations where remains were found. While the property has since changed hands, its legacy as the site of such horrific crimes endures. The stories of hauntings and paranormal activity only add to the lore and ensure Fox Hollow Farm remains a place of both historical and macabre interest. The discovery at Fox Hollow Farm shocked the community and the nation. The property, once a symbol of prosperity, became a grim reminder of Baumeister's heinous acts. Forensic teams worked diligently to identify the remains found on the property, providing closure to the families of the victims. However, due to the state of decomposition and the number of remains, many victims remain unidentified. We're in the basement of the house. Um, it's uh, being remodeled, so that's why it looks the way it does. But uh, this is an area where uh, the police have theorized where um, Herb killed most of his victims. Um, uh, Herb was a prolific videographer, apparently, and um, the police told me they believe this is where he had a, a, a hidden video camera, and uh, the theory is that he might have videotaped some of the killings. Um, there's an area right here in a, a ventilation vent that uh, they believe a camera was placed. When he fled to Canada after the uh, news that the bones were found here on the property, uh, a Canadian Mounted Police had stopped him the night before because he had stopped to sleep under a bridge and she had shown a light in the back of the car and the back seat of the car was full of videotapes. Uh, when our police from Hamilton County got up there, the car was empty. Rob and Vicki Graves had found what appeared to be their dream home, looking to escape the big city life and take up a more rural one for themselves and their two teenage sons. They found Fox Hollow Farm and were shocked at how affordable it was for the sheer size and quality of the property. Sensing that it was too good to be true, they asked what could possibly be wrong with it, because at a passing glance, it seemed absolutely gorgeous. Then it came to Rob. He had remembered the name from a news broadcast many years ago. Unbeknownst to him and his wife, they were now standing on the very same grounds that were once owned by Herb Baumeister, the notorious serial killer. They immediately brought this up to the real estate agent who was showing them the property and were immediately told that that was indeed the case. That the private investor had indeed purchased the estate from the widow of Herb following the disturbing discovery of the bodies back in the 1990s, but that it had been completely remodeled from head to toe, removing any and all remnants of what it looked like when the murders had taken place all those years ago. But that's why it was indeed so affordable, because no one wanted to live there due to the history. After some further discussion among the couple, they ultimately decided to purchase the property. Within a couple weeks, the family moves in and falls in love with Fox Hollow Farm. The teenage sons soon make it a habit to play outside and then wash off in the pool in the basement, soon tracking dirt and gravel all throughout the home. One day, Vicky is vacuuming up the dirt that the boys had brought in from the outside around the pool, when suddenly her vacuum loses power. Believing that perhaps she had accidentally unplugged it from the outlet, she plugged it back in and continued her work. Within several more minutes, it happened again. Perplexed this time because she was even more aware and careful about the cord in the outlet, she knew she hadn't unplugged it. So she plugged it back in and triple checked that it wasn't just falling out of the outlet by pulling the cord. Ever more aware this time, she goes back to vacuum, but keeping a present eye on the cord itself, and to her amazement, it pulls out on its own, as if someone had grabbed and pulled it out of the socket. Startled, she drops the vacuum 
who was beside herself. She doesn't know how to make sense of what had just happened. And this would just be the beginning of the strangeness that would occur. Rob worked at a car dealership, and one of his employees was a man named Joe. Joe had been a great employee, but had a problem of being chronically late most of the time. As he probed to figure out what was going on, Joe informed Rob that he lived over an hour away and really needed the job and would be willing to move closer if the opportunity presented itself. Well, Rob thought about it and ended up offering Joe a place to rent. Located on Fox Hollow Farm, they had a guest house that they were considering renting out as apartments for quite some time, and this seemed like the perfect opportunity to benefit everyone involved. Joe would indeed move in just a few days later. It takes several hours, but within that time frame, they're able to get everything inside and finish the move. Exhausted, Joe decides to retire for the night with his dog, Fred. As he lays down to sleep in his newly set up bed, he then finds himself in a horrific nightmare. He's being chased throughout Fox Hollow Farm by something he can't see. The dream is so intense that it causes him to sleepwalk, which wasn't something that he was known to do. He began to run while still dreaming, and ran directly into the door frame as he tried to escape the guest house. Falling back, he knocked into a nearby glass of water, which fell and shattered, cutting his hands. The impact and cutting of his hands finally woke him up, and he was forced to sit back and ponder just what had taken place. And things would only intensify from here. Another day soon after, Rob was painting the side of their home a different color. As he and his wife remarked on how nice the finished job will be, she spots something out of the corner of her eye. She had seen a man in a red shirt staring at them. As she broke away from her husband and began to approach the figure, it started to walk away from her and quickly disappeared as if it never existed. The couple then called out and checked the perimeter, but never found anyone. They dismiss the person as nothing more than a curious trespasser. I mean, after all, they did purchase a serial killer's home. They just had to accept that curious people may sneak up just to get a look at their home. Later that night, Joe was doing the dishes in his apartment when he suddenly gets a series of knocks on his front door. Telling the person it'll just be a minute as he dries his hands off to go and answer the door, the series of knocks begin to grow louder and more aggressive. Thinking it was extremely strange or extremely urgent concerning Vicky or Rob, he went and answered the door as it was still being knocked upon. However, as he opened the door, there was no one to be found. Automatically on guard, he peers outside. The knocking had been happening when he answered the door, so no person could have got very far while he answered mid knock. He glanced around and yet saw and heard nothing. He stepped outside and began to examine the roof and the nearby areas, and still there was nothing. Thoroughly weirded out at this point, he made his way back inside and bolted the door locked behind him. He started to make his way back to the kitchen to finish doing his dishes, when he spotted a man standing in his bedroom, staring at him. Upon spotting the figure, his dog begins to growl and make sounds that he's never heard him make before, staring directly in the direction of the bedroom. Already on edge, he ran into the bedroom and flicked the light on, only to discover that there was again no one there. Searching the entire apartment, he again found nothing. Trying to rationalize and clear his mind, he decided to take his dog Fred for a walk to calm down and unwind for the evening. While on his walk around the property, he thought to check on Rob and Vicky's house to see if the lights were on. This would indicate to him that perhaps they were the ones who had knocked on his door, and therefore he could rest easy and figure out what it was about the following morning. However, upon arriving at their house, he found it completely blacked out. They had already gone to bed for the night. Fred, who was always a loyal and obedient dog, always walked with him without a leash and would always follow his commands. However, tonight would be a different story. 
Deciding to head back to his apartment, he motioned for Fred to join him, but the dog would not budge. He suddenly began to growl and then bolted into the nearby tree line. Instinctively, Joe ran after his dog, but not before seeing what his dog was running after. Before his eyes and the very same tree line was a man in a red shirt. Although he was absolutely terrified, Joe couldn't let anything happen to his beloved dog so he continued to run towards this man, when suddenly, whoever, or whatever this was, disappeared before his eyes. Although slightly behind, he would quickly catch up to Fred, and now noticed him not acting aggressive at all, but rather showing his belly in submission, staring in the direction of Joe. Joe, knowing his dog, knew that something very strange had to be up with him, he suddenly felt as if someone was staring directly at him. He slowly turned around to see the apparition of a man in a red shirt with a twisted face staring back at him just several feet away. Joe, as most of us would, ran out of there as fast as he could, his loyal companion following him. The two run as fast as they can back to the apartment where they rush inside lock and deadbolt the door, and nervously watch out of the blinds for the rest of the night. The following morning, an even more exhausted Joe makes his way to Vicky and Rob's house to discuss the prior night's events. As he's telling both of them what happened, Vicky starts to become emotional. She too had seen the man in red just days earlier. She points to where she saw him, and lo and behold, it's the exact same spot that Joe had encountered the entity the night before. As the day progressed to night, Joe yet again found himself in his apartment, hoping to finally get some rest. But as he settled down in his bed, he was suddenly startled by knocking at his door. As he yelled out, Who is it? As he made his way towards the door, he didn't receive an audible answer back. Just more aggressive knocking at the door. The door itself now was shaking. Facing his fear of the unknown, mid-knock, Joe throws the door open, only to meet face to face with nothing. As he frantically looks around the yard while holding the door, he notices that the door's knocking apparatus is sticking straight out as if someone is holding it. It then drops one last time, knocking the door. Absolutely petrified, Joe slams the door and locks it. As he tries to catch his breath and takes several steps backwards, he sees the doorknob begin to turn. Then, without warning, the door bursts open, shattering the lock. The open door yet again reveals no one. After a moment of frozen terror, Joe runs outside and into the front yard of his apartment, screaming and searching all around for just who could be doing this. After several minutes, he stares back into the house through the open front door and sees a man dressed in all white standing there. He's soaked from head to toe in what appears to be water and is screaming in a muted voice as if he's being held underwater. He then bolts towards Joe and seemingly disappears into a mist. Frantically calling out to his dog Fred to accompany him, Joe frantically makes his way to Rob and Vicky's house on the property. He's so terrified that he's shaking now, and Rob and Vicky are just as scared. They now truly believe that they are dealing with something paranormal in nature. In order to rationalize the situation and make sense of what was taking place, they begin to believe that they're experiencing the results of the murders conducted by Herb Baumeister, and that his victims are either trapped here somehow, where their energy is stuck in an endless loop, replaying their final and tragic moments over and over and over again. Refusing to return to his apartment, Rob and Vicky, being the supportive friends they were, agreed that Joe could stay the night with them, and together they would begin researching online to try and formulate some kind of a plan of action of what to do next. As they collectively scour the Baumeister case information, they find themselves looking at the list of identified victims. 
As they get deeper into the details, Joe is shocked. He stops them on a picture of a man in a white shirt. That was the man I saw in my apartment, who was soaked from head to toe, and screaming. Although this information still scares them, it does help reassure them that they are indeed dealing with the victims of this horrendous tragedy. They are especially convinced, considering many of the remains have never been identified, so they continue to research the case. After several uneventful days, Joe finds himself almost compelled to walk around the property with his dog, except this time in broad daylight. So, apprehensively, he makes his way with Fred to the area where both he and Vicky had seen the man in red on separate occasions. Just past the tree line on the walking path, Joe is stopped by what looks to be a bone. He believes that it's impossible that such a bone could have been missed during the extensive searches over the years. But nonetheless, it was right here, right now, as if it had been placed there for him to discover. Quickly consulting and showing Rob and Vicky the discovery, they too believed that this could be a bone belonging to the mysterious man in red. They ended up contacting the lead detective on the Baumeister case and submitted the bone, which turned out to be a human femur bone, in his evidence and for analysis. They then requested if the investigator himself could come out to the property and explain to them just where things had taken place so they could have a better understanding of what had happened, to which he obliged. Several days passed, and Joe by this point had made his way back to his apartment to try and settle back in given the new information. While on his computer checking his emails, he began to hear a scraping almost metallic-like sound originating from the kitchen. Upon further examination, he sees that all of his butcher knives from his knife block have been neatly arranged in his sink, placed in a row, equally spaced from one another. Glancing around the room, he spots fresh, deep cuts in the wood of the nearby counter cabinet. He believes that this could be a sign for one of the victims crying for help. He starts to try and figure out the mystery. He takes out his phone and begins recording, asking probing questions to whoever or whatever could be there in hopes of helping them in any way that he can. Prior to this, of course, he turned off any and all appliances that could interfere with the process. He begins by asking a series of questions and doesn't seem to get much of anything, at least not audibly. But then towards the end of his questions, Fred begins to growl, the same eerie growl he had any time they had experienced something previously. Taking this as confirmation that perhaps his companion could see or hear something that he couldn't, he quickly downloads the audio file and begins to listen to it on his computer. And to his shock, he did indeed receive a response. This is the clip of the actual EVP that was recorded. Who keeps walking in the kitchen? He believes he hears the married one. But in all of their research, all of the victims were young, single gay men. The only one who was married was one Herb Baumeister. This revelation is startling. He not only believes that the victims were trapped within the grounds of Fox Hollow Farm, but that perhaps the serial killer himself could too be trapped here. What would follow would be dozens of paranormal investigations, and those investigations would lead the group to believe that they were not only dealing with the spirits of the victims haunting the grounds, but either a dark entity impersonating Baumeister or the killer himself. Several years after the events, the Graves family would end up selling Fox Hollow Farm, and it would continue to change hands over the years since then leading to multiple new owners of the property. And although new information doesn't seem to be publicly available, it's still considered one of the most haunted places in Indiana, if not the world, given its unique and gruesome history. An independent film would go on to be made about it, called The Haunting of Fox Hollow Farm, and Robert Graves, along with another man named Richard Eastep, who led many paranormal investigations at Fox Hollow Farm, would co-write a book detailing the family's creepy experiences and what they believe to be ultimately happening. 
So in conclusion, we know that Herb Baumeister was mentally ill, ultimately. But what makes this case so strange and so compelling to me is that he was an outstanding member of this community. For the longest time, he was the smiling neighbor, the charitable businessman, the happy family man, and overall, a pillar of normalcy. But behind closed doors, his psyche, his soul, contained a darkness that most of us will never be able to comprehend, yet alone unravel and understand. So could the murderous deeds of a twisted individual trap souls on a property and perhaps open some kind of a portal? Could the unleashing of such energy like what is expressed in a violent death contribute to something like this? If it wasn't what's known as an intelligent haunting, where the spirits are aware of what has happened to them and are indeed trapped there, which very well could still be the case, then perhaps it could be a residual haunting where the events are of such magnitude and strength that they play on a loop for all time. But the souls who were involved have long since moved on. These are questions that we may never have answers to, but all things that we should ponder. But one thing is for certain. The malicious calculation of Herb Baumeister and the horrendous things that he did to the suspected 25 victims at Fox Hollow Farms should never be forgotten. They are indeed still identifying and using updated technology to identify remains that are still being found on the grounds. This has happened as recent as November of 2022. So if you happen to be a family member of someone that you suspect could be connected to this case, just know that my heart truly does go out to you. And please contact the Hamilton County Coroner's Office at 317-770-44. One five. Besides remembering what happened, I also urge you to please respect the victims and their families, as well as the family of her Baumeister, if you should ever have anything to do with them. Picking up the pieces of an Indiana tragedy, like the bones left behind by a suspected killer who never faced justice. Char, broken buried, discarded. More than 20 suspected homosexuals have died violent deaths. Authorities believe all of the victims frequented gay bars here in Indianapolis. If they murder one person, they're not going to stop. It almost appears Mr. Baumeister was leaving a double life. Still to come, what Debbie Falls remembers to this day about the hours she spent with the man later connected to her brother's death. He was very strange. I don't know what part of them they saw, but I saw a different man. How does that even happen? Like, the guy that just murdered your brother, or found to murder him, is right here, and I've been working for him this whole time. That's weird. Thrift store. I sorted through all the clothing, and that went out on the front like Goodwill to sell on Washington Street in Indianapolis. My brother was missing at the time. There was nothing fancy. He wasn't distinguished. He was not even verbally um, communicative. He would sit back there with me and sort through those clothes and not say a word to me. I took a paycheck from this man he killed my brother. Um, he could have killed me if he would have known if that maybe I put an inkling to it. I don't know what you think you just call the police and they go out and find him. You know, that's what you know, that's what you think. You know, we didn't think about hiring a detective or a private investigator. There was no APB, there was no bolo, there was nothing put out for him. You know, they just let him go. And he went to Canada and he robbed everybody of justice. You can't if you don't know where he is. I don't wish that on nobody. I mean, at least we had some form of closure that we had something. They never had anything, so I'm sure they're wondering, waiting for them to walk in the door, probably still today, you know, like I did. <laughs> 
Debbie Falls. I grew up in the southeast side of Indianapolis on Bradbury. It was a good time. You know, uh, you thought you could trust people a lot more than today. We call him Richie. Yeah, his name is Richard Douglas. I think I was like 17 when he went missing. He was um, eccentric a little bit, you know. He was really smart. Uh, he was real tall, you know, real long arms, real long legs. And um, he was just everybody's friend, you know. He wanted a place to fit in, you know, because he was so tall and so blinky. You can pick any word out of the dictionary and he would spell it forward and backwards. I mean, he was, he was smart. He was a little different. He would stand up for people and he loved people, you know. He was just really a genuine good, good soul. I miss his voice. I could still hear him. And he was funny. What was his character to give off to, to lure these individuals, these young men, for a ride? Uh, or anything? Or come party with me? Or hang out with me? What did he say? How did you manage to do that? How did he convince them? I would love to know more. There's a lot of unanswered questions. For as young as he was, for the little life that he did have, he was a good person. I knew that, you know, he wanted to get married, you know, and I know he had a girlfriend. He never came to me and said, I'm gay, or I'm bisexual, or I'm any of anything. You know, he never came out to any of us about any of that. There was many years that went by that we had no idea what even happened, you know. We were searching for him. I'm really not sure how he ended up where he was when we never heard from him. You know, it was like months went by and nothing. We had, you know, no, no cell phones. Uh, no paper trail. We didn't know that he frequent any places. Uh, we didn't really know his newfound friends. There is danger in the unknown. It's the very reason why Debbie Falls believes people need to know what happened to her brother and to other innocent men. I think people need to know that there was this serial killer your brother's missing the man that you're working for killed him you know um you took a paycheck from him and it was just guilt i mean just so much absorption of guilt that i felt from that i mean it took years to find him to find out what happened to him for the testing and then to get something back and have a service it was years Years. I don't know if I could mentally take it if we didn't have something. I mean, all we had was a couple bone fragments, you know, and some teeth. He was buried in a baby casket, yeah. I was pregnant with my daughter when we got to bury him. By the dates on them bones, you know, the estimated time of death, it, it wasn't long after he went missing that he was already gone. People need to be careful, and they need to, just because somebody's nice to you, that don't make them your friend. Don't go with these people. I hope they get at least peace of knowing that they have something of their loved ones. My mom had to pay, you know, to get, you know, some of the bones tested to find what were of my brothers um, so we could bury him. and. There was people in there with brown bags that didn't have nobody picking them up. I miss his voice. I could still hear him. I just hope nobody ever has to experience that, you know, um, the unknown is really terrible. I, as a sister, I cried really hard for my brother, 
but I watched my mom and that's why I keep saying it's going to be good news for the mothers that are still alive because this has been 30 years. Manuel Resendez. He was just a really, really nice, kind person. Manuel, he's number 10, I'm no. number 11, and 16 kids. And he's the first one in our family to graduate. And Manuel just decided. And he went out there and he worked his butt off and he got his own senior pictures. He played every instrument. He started out with the cornet and went to the clarinet, saxophone, flute. He played the music. He hung with this child. That was his little buddy. And they did a lot of stuff together. He's got a granddaughter now that he never met. And he got things going for himself. He, and, and he was the first. He was the first in our family every time. It didn't matter what it was. Good stuff. He worked at a, um, like a group home or something like that in Lafayette. He was kind to those kids. He helped those kids and he did everything he could for them. And he came up missing, okay? And people were upset because a gay guy was working at a boy's home. He didn't keep it a secret and they loved him there at work. And people were upset, not even, even thinking about the fact that he was the victim. I don't know how to describe it. Horrible. And I know it had to be horrific for my mom. That was her baby. When Manuel disappeared, he took a big old chunk because, you know, she ended up dying in 94, where he disappeared in 93. So she ended up dying and she asked me, while she was in the hospital, she asked me to, you know, she said, bring my gown and bring me some slippers. And I said, okay. She said, hey. And I said, why? She said, bring Manuel to me. I said, okay, mom, you want me to bring your slippers and your gown? And you want me to bring Manuel? I'll be here in the morning. And I turned around and I was like, I just started bawling because I, di I didn't know how I was going to bring him. I knew where her gown and her slippers were, but you know, she died that later on that night, so she found him. I'm not ashamed that he's gay. That's one of the, the questions that they asked me and my sister was telling me in Spanish, don't tell him. She was saying in Spanish, don't, don't say anything about that, just tell him, you know, uh, to look for him. And I said, yes, he is. And she told me later, she was like, they're not going to look for him as hard, which made me feel really bad because I, I didn't get what she was saying to me. I didn't. My mom was just walking around with her, uh, her heart. I mean, she was literally bent over. Her heart was so heavy and she didn't know that the rest of her kids were there because she was looking for the one. It was just one of the most horrific, saddest things that I have ever watched and lived. Baumeister's story had just popped in, it was breaking news, and I was sitting at the corner of the bed, and I swear on everything I love, that TV zoomed in. I mean, it just came to me while they were talking and stuff, and I knew my brother was in there. I wondered, and I got the horrible news. It's worse, in my opinion, to wonder because you don't know. If you get your brother or your son's ashes back, uh, at least you got something there if you want to go to a special spot and talk to them. You can't if you don't know where he is. August 11th of that year, they come knocking at my door and they told me that they had found him. Part of his jaw was found in, in those uh, remains that were found in Baumeister's um, property. And Baumeister had killed himself. I think they need to go home. I think that uh, there's mothers like my mom that has went to heaven and have found their child there. But the ones that are still here need their babies home. Home. On this particular case here, there, there's something strange about it. Uh, 
after talking with the, with the parents, uh, this is not your normal, typical uh, runaway report or missing person or whatever. I hate to say it, but I, yeah, I think something happened to him. Or he'd be here, or he'd let me know where he's at. Eight days after he disappeared, Michael Riley's body was found in shallow water under a bridge in an isolated part of Hancock County. There were bruises on his neck. An autopsy later determined he had been strangled. I think any time you find this many victims in this short a period of time, you have to assume that they're related to some degree. By June of 1983, a task force representing investigators from nine counties, local police departments, and state police began digging deep into eight of the cases. But investigators leave a strong impression that the task force will be operational for several months, if not a year, at least until all the leads have been exhausted or the murders have been solved. A tip led the task force to a man named Larry Eiler, originally from Crawfordsville. Eiler's arrest in Illinois for a similar murder there was secured mainly by the work of the Indiana investigators. But for their own cases, they have just circumstantial evidence. A lot of it, but still just circumstantial. The task force questioned him, but they had no grounds to hold him. So they had to release Eiler. Months later, Eiler was arrested again. August 21st, 1984, a young boy named Danny Bridges uh, is found in a dumpster behind the apartment where Larry Eiler lived. He was charged with the murder of Danny Bridges and then he was convicted and sentenced to death. With Larry Eiler in prison, the task force eventually ended. But the work of the serial killer known as the I-70 Strangler continued. By 1990, investigators in central Indiana and now Ohio are once again looking into the murders of men with ties to the gay community. Law enforcement officials hope that the latest murders do not stump them for as long or claim as many lives. For the record, dating back to 1985, five bodies have turned up in Ohio. The latest corpse remains unidentified. All the victims were strangled and all hailed from central Indiana. Authorities believe all of the victims frequented gay bars here in Indianapolis.